Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Because of the pain we all felt after the 2008-2009 Great Recession, literally, for years we referred to the subsequent economy as a, quote, recovery, end quote. And then it started, we started calling it just an expansion, and now as it approaches one of the longest expansions in contemporary U.S. history, now, how should we call it? How should we label it? To use the poker analogy, what tells is the 2018 business cycle displaying about the underlying economy? Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I'm Chris William. Happy New Year, and thank you for supporting this program. This is the first of a two-part series that we do each year to do two things, to look back where we've been in 2018, and then next week on part two is a look ahead to 2019 and beyond. We host our four resident economists who will mix it up in just a moment, and we hope you'll stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, the economic year in review, featuring guest panelists Sarah House of Wells Fargo Securities, Dr. Matt Martin from the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Charlotte Branch, Dr. John Connaughton of UNC Charlotte, and Dr. Doug Woodward from the University of South Carolina. Welcome to our program. Happy New Year. Good to have you all here. Good to be here. Yeah, good to Looking be here. Looking good, happy, healthy. Sarah, let, let's start with you. I'm just, Sarah, I'm giving you a warning. With this gang, you've got to jump in. Mm -hmm. We'll this do. Is, we'll okay. do. What was the sleeper issue of 2018, you think, for you? So I'd say the sleeper issue in terms of what maybe economists weren't quite expecting or was really the strength of the jobs market, particularly the hiring picture. So we actually saw hiring accelerate this year, more than 200,000 jobs per month. So that was up from about 170 last year. And so um, that was particularly in some industries that had really been, been lagging the overall expansion. Mm -hmm. So construction, manufacturing, energy came back and, and the transfer, transportation sector is, has been red hot. So I'd say um, maybe what we missed in, in terms of our es estimates were we weren't optimistic enough about the hiring numbers thinking that supply was was really becoming a constraint in terms of the availability mm -hmm. of, of workers. Any surprises? John? I don't think, to me there weren't that many surprises. I mean when you look at the employment numbers this year, yeah they're up from from last year, but you know, if you look at the last five years, they're right. They fall right in line with that. You know, two, 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 three million, something like that, jobs a year. Um, I don't think there have been. I think everybody expected that there would be a Trump bump this year once those uh, tax changes took place last year, and uh, we've seen that take place. Right. We've seen a, a bump up in the second and third quarter from that meager two percent growth rate to something approaching three and a half to four percent. Um, that was expected. The, the, of course, the big question is how long will it last? Any surprises for you, Doug? Yeah, big surprise. Um, not so surprised about the jobs. Uh, it was pretty much in line with our predictions for our forecast in South Carolina. But what surprised me was, I want to get this right, the USMCA got passed. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I didn't think we were going to negotiate and not be able to talk about NAFTA anymore. And then this, this is really big uh, for the Carolinas. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting how it plays out next year. But just having that passed this year was a surprise to me. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. that that's important. Matt? What do you think? I, I think that's right. I, was, I haven't done this math, but I think if you go back and look at those, like some around the table who do the, the annual forecasting, my guess is folks didn't revise their forecast near as much going throughout the year as we saw. I think back earlier in the recovery, everybody started the year out at 3%, ended the year at 2%. Um, this year, I think everybody started somewhere around three, and that's where we're going to end up. Did Was there any, you know, John, you, you said something about the Trump up, and you also, you know, one of the words 
And one of the comments that came out of the, the executive suite, the president's office, was this idea that there would be 4% in GDP growth. And I remember thinking at the time, and I heard a lot of comments, people kind of laughed it off, but there really was some pretty robust growth. That wasn't a surprise to you that it was that, that aggressive? Not given, not given the way that tax package was formulated, and more importantly, given the way they redrew the uh, withholding tables uh, starting in February of 2018, which gave everybody a pay increase, which I hate to tell them probably won't be in effect when they start doing their taxes in, in, in February and March. Uh, so I, I don't think that seeing this 4% th come through in the middle of the year is that big a surprise. I mean, obviously what we're waiting for is the end of January when we see the fourth quarter numbers um, to see whether or not that continues. But this can't continue for a variety of reasons we can get into later. Okay, so back to what you said, Sarah, about the, the labor market being a surprise to you. Does that mean that the specter of inflation is kind of hanging out in the wings and waiting now that we've got this strong labor market, that this will show up? Not necessarily, because some of the surprising strength was from the fact that we've seen participation pick up. So that's helped mute wage and, pressures and to some mean? extent. So more people are, are actually engaged in the labor market. They're actually looking, looking for a job, and more and more are finding a job, given that we've actually seen unemployment can continue to decline. So that's helped keep wage pressures muted. Um, and you have to also think that you know corporate profits have been at a record high, and so there's, there's still some room for wages go up without necessarily uh, companies having to pass that on via via cost. So mm -hmm. so there's room for wages to pick up and the labor market to tighten without inflation necessarily mm -hmm. getting out of hand. Does it, were you going to say something? Did I just interrupt? I, I just, one thing we haven't talked about is that bumped up the GDP growth was we had some increase in real investment finally this year. Capital now that's investment? Capital investment. Private capital investment. Private and capital investment, yeah. It, it grew as we would expect after the tax cut, but mm -hmm. it seems like that's, that's slowed down a little bit. But in the middle of the year, we're finally seeing something so important to the future of our economy and our productivity. And public, that, that, uh, go ahead, I please. was going to say in public investment, too. So part yeah, of the, part of the Trump bump wasn't just the, the tax cut deal but also just the direct federal government spending bump we saw with the budget deal passed. You mean in transportation, in infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, that type? Defen defense yeah. spending, defense. yep. A lot of defense spending. All of that spending. discretionary yeah. spending. That's a bit, that's a, defense is a big one. Mm -hmm. Does Was there some new, and I know the Fed, uh, Matt, has this, of course, statistically important numbers that, that you will look at, but also as as, as Chair uh, Greenspan would look at some of these nuanced things that weren't necessarily the scientific part. So is there anything in that area, the not so scientific act, uh, you know, numbers that show up here? It, well, I mean, this is a big part of the work we do regionally, just getting a sense from business leaders, not just what they're doing, but why they're doing it. I, I don't think there was a whole lot of surprise until we get to the later part of the year. I'd say starting in the fall, as people started to look forward, then then you start to get a little bit of this. Things are great now. As far as I can see in the near future, through the end of the year, maybe early next year, they're still going to be great. But I have perhaps some nagging doubt that there's something out there that's uh -huh. going to derail this. Home sales, commercial real estate. Seems like they're both, I hate to use this term bubble, but they seem like they approach a bubble status. No, no chance. No, no. no that's no, not Home sales it. are falling off. I'd like to want, add one more thing. Um, about the labor market this year. Um, it has tightened tremendously. I think this is as tight a labor market as we're sitting here right now in December. This is as tight a labor market as we've seen probably in most of our professional lives. Yeah. Uh, this, we, right now we're sitting at 3.7% unemployment. That tells a little bit of a story. But there are other things as well. During the peak of the Great Recession, there were six job openings for every unemployed person. Today, there are, more, there are more job openings than there are unemployed people. Now, when you've got a six to one ratio, it's pretty sure that you can find somebody in that uh, one out of six that actually have the mm -hmm. skill set you're looking for. When you're less than one to one, um, you're not only going to have trouble finding people, you're going to definitely have problems with a skill match. Uh, and so that really is a, a serious problem that we've got ourselves into during this year when the unemployment rate came down so so tremendously. So that's, yeah. a, that's something that really concerns me. And, you know, we're seeing we're probably going to end up when it's all said and done with a 3 percent rate of inflation this year notwithstanding the energy prices coming down. You think when the numbers are revised, quarter. we'll look back and we'll that, be able to print that? Yeah, I think you hmm. will be able to. D Doug, you know, they, and let me take that one, one more step. In South Carolina, it was a yeah. bit surprising. I know you know this number better than I, so please don't hesitate to correct me. You wouldn't, but I hope you will anyway. Okay. 
uh, the idea that South Carolina, for the first time in many years, had a decline in trade or exports, yes, is that right? That's true. How does that, when you overlay whatever China and the U.S. are going back and forth on trade, and when you overlay this dialogue we just had about what happened in labor in 2018, how does that, how does that square with that number? That this well, decline? exports aren't the biggest part, the uh, biggest driver of our economy. It'd be consumption, business investment, government spending. Uh, but exports were down, um, and that's not just exports That's uh, from South Carolina. That's exports out of the region through the port. Uh, and that's concerning, and we do believe that is largely due to the tariffs. Um, and even though some of the companies are not saying this publicly, we know that BMW's production numbers were down because they weren't selling to China with a 40% tariff put on their, their auto exports. Now, that's coming back down, hopefully, but uh, mm -hmm. that's, that, that hit us pretty well, hard. Why wouldn't they be more vocal about that? Why, and let's use BMW as an example. Why wouldn't I they I think talk they're about just, that? just trying to assess the situation right now. It's, it's you know, it, it, they have to look at the latest tweet to figure out what their, the strategy is going to be uh, going forward. And so I don't think they, I, I, I think this was a temporary downturn in their production. I think they'll be back up and they're committed still to capital investment in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Volvo too also, they, they did say publicly that uh, they're scaling back their investment as a result of, of the tariffs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they but, just got started this year. Yeah, well, Doug, didn't didn't BMW go through a couple of model changeovers this year, which could have affected their output? Yes, that's true. Um, they they specialize in the X series, as you might know, the SUV, and they that's export the production that lining seventy percent to the rest of the world. That's why they're hit so hard. They're the major exporter, really the only major uh, auto exporter in the United States. So they're the ones most affected. They specialize the production in the X series. They sell that in China. Now they're going to start making it in China as a result of. These, these tariffs. What, what's the proprietary dialogue that goes on, not the proprietary, but the one that you can talk about, Matt, that goes on in the Fed about just this issue about trade, tariffs, and how Doug had just articulated well, I, that? Well, I can tell you how I think about it. There, there are other companies as examples, and if you think in the short run, changing the mix of production so that you're producing more locally to avoid the tariffs, that's bound to have some sort of efficiency uh, loss, right? So instead of making eight different types of widgets, maybe that plant makes 10 or 12. And so you'll see there's a little bit of a contribution to inflation because you're, you're not as productive doing as much. And so prices are, are bound to creep up. Over the longer term, it becomes a capital investment issue, right? So as companies sort through and figure out whether this is a permanent thing or not, right. it becomes this issue of you want more production locally. So companies that aren't in the U.S. would tend to invest here. Uh, but other companies would, would have to think about if they're exporting to China, do we put something there? Are you hearing from your members that this is temporary? From or businesses? They think um, that they, it's temporary? I, the businesses that I've talked to recently are at least thinking about what the future looks like, if not making actual capital decisions mm -hmm. about that right now. Yeah. If you are uh, joining us, you are watching part one of our economic review. Next week is part two, and we'll look ahead to 2019 in case you're wondering why we're not talking about that. Now, I want to come back to, I, I said, I said uh, home sales and commercial real estate. Uh, Sarah, I want to start with commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. You're hard-pressed to not go to one of the urban cores, Charleston, Greenville, Charlotte, Raleigh, Wilmington, Asheville. Even Columbia, to some degree, and I'm not <laughs> saying it that way, but I'd say they've, they've kind of missed uh, some of this, this growth. Yes. But how, how can there not be um, a lot of momentum? Man, that's not the right way to say it. How can there not be approaching a bubble status in underwriting and asset levels and money going into that particular sector? Well, I think you've had some some tightening in standards over, over the past few years. So they've kind of evened out more recently, but I think there have been some current concerns about overbuilding. And so the, the lending has has reflected that in mm -hmm. terms of, of maybe looking a little bit harder about, okay, what's what's the underlying demand? So I think there has been some some moderation in, in that activity. Um, we've seen prices uh, appreciate more more slowly in the commercial real estate sector as, as well. And so I think there there is some recognition of that and, and some caution among investors and, and lenders as well. So is there caution around cap rates, around returns, around costs to do these projects now? To some extent. So we've seen cap rates um, maybe not go up in, in a lot of different CRE sectors, but at least stabilize finally after mm -hmm. years of, of moving downward. So I think there is some, some recognition that um, maybe not quite bubble territory, but that you know, valuations are, are elevated. And so we're seeing that, that begin to mm -hmm. be reflected in the pricing. Any comments, gentlemen? 
I would say that I would be less worried about that <clears throat> going forward than I was, say, in 2006 and 7. Yeah. Banks are less involved in this sector than they were before. So a lot of the funding that's going into the commercial side now <clears throat> is not from banks. And so... Not uh, untraditional pools of money. Yeah. Banks have, have, ha have cut back on their own, but they've also, regulation has forced them to cut back somewhat. Yeah. And so they're less exposed to that risk today than they were a dozen years ago when, when they were very exposed and, you know, when they started to tumble it got yeah, a little bit. Yeah, we remember messy. that well. Yes. <laughs> well. What about the hot markets like Charleston and Greenville? Well, yeah, they continue to do well. You know, all the growth is in the urban areas. We still have some some lagging areas, but they're, they're rural, um, the, where the population centers are also uh, right next to Charlotte here in York County. These are the hot, hot markets right but now. Do, but do you worry but, about asset prices, uh, real asset prices in those areas? Maybe Charleston. Maybe Charleston. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, Matt, you want to wade in on that? It, if you want to talk about the housing piece, that's the one, and maybe we should have talked up front as maybe a bit of a surprise, why we're not building more housing. Um, so I think there's issues around the mix, single family versus multifamily, maybe multifamily's providing a little bit more. Um, but it just, you talk to builders and the, the obstacles and the costs seem to be dramatic. I mean, it starts at the permitting process, the lot development process, finding labor to do the work, uh, all that builds in cost and delays, and so I, we're just not building as much. The cost of lumber, I'll just throw that in. The cost of lumber now as lot. well. I uh, had one builder tell me that in his career, he's never seen as big a gap between the cost to build a new home and the price of a comparable existing home. Has it slowed the progress in home building? Yes, oh, absolutely. Dramatically? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's fallen that. during this year as well. It's, it's actually come down in the fourth quarter. Is it because of the? Is, is, I'm sorry, sir. Is there? Is that because of the cost, John, or the the, the process? And the, is that because of the cost or the demand? It's it's primarily on the cost side. Yeah. It's this mm -hmm. this is, we lost a lot of builders, and In a lot of and yeah, and a lot of a lot of trades at that time, um, and so it's it's ri it's risen the price of doing this activity. Plus, bank, again, banks aren't in this space like they were a dozen years but, ago. But private equity, I'm sorry, sir, I promise mm -hmm. I'm going to give you no, a chance. Okay. But, but <laughs> private equity has gotten into the space in a big way where the in 08, 9, 10, they went in mm -hmm. and purchased these tracts of land and the asset, the underlying asset, and are now deploying that and selling that off. So has that changed the, the calculus in it? Uh, well, again, if, when we look at single family homes, we're looking at a, I think, a, a substantial secular change here. Uh, from where we were a dozen years ago when uh, 67, 68 percent of folks mm -hmm. lived in single family owner occupied houses. And we've seen that number come down for a variety of re reasons. One is on the supply side, but another is on the demand side. I mean, mm -hmm. millennials really don't want to own a house. Yeah. Just like eventually they're not going to want to own a car either, and that's another <laughs> issue. They've got to pay off their student debt. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say that uh, on, on the supply side, um, or, or the cost, it really has been more of a cost issue because, you know, the consumer's actually done very well this, this past right. year. And so I think, you know, they've actually seen income, income growth pick up, um, but you are seeing you know, the years of appreciation of 6% plus, um, mm -hmm. well ahead of, of wage gains, has, has really been a struggle for a lot of households. And now with mortgage rates rising, too, um, it's it's been even even tougher if you know if you think of that overall payment where the the interest cost of that is is going mm -hmm. up. Um, although I'd say I, I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic on on the millennial home buying. We've actually seen the the home ownership rates among that group pick up more than more than any other this past year. And I think what do you think caused that? Well, I, th I think that, you know millennials too will will grow up, and they yes. are they are beginning <laughs> to, and so we Have are still new <laughs> too. Um, I kind of sort of. I am technically a millennial, okay. yes, <laughs> um, on on the older older spectrum of it, yeah. and I think um, you know millennials we've seen them push back major life events. Part of that's because the educational debt, but also just getting their career started later. But as they hit those milestones, whether it's marriage, kids, we do see that that traditional um, desire to to own a home come back but it's been very tough where a lot of the building that we have actually seen has been in more of your your middle to to upper tier homes um, just given that because of the cost we've seen the the mar margins compress so much for builders that they they really need to make it kind of a, a middle tier mm -hmm. home there's just there's mm -hmm. just no margin there on those entry level homes so that's been a, a dislocation for mm -hmm. for millennials matt were you going to add something no i think that's absolutely right the there aren't 
so many starter homes being built because it's just you, you can't do it at the cost. It's, no, you can't. Do we have a glut of inventory in multifamily and, and apartment homes then? Are we going to find that, to use your terms here about the millennials, this is kind of the antelope going through the python that once this demographic really pushes through to older ages, all of a sudden we've got a lot of empty apartment homes. I'd, I'd say we've seen the apartment building begin to slow down a little bit, and so that's taking some, uh, some of the pressure off. And to John's point, you know, we're, we're still probably gonna see more of, of this generation be renters or be in multifamily homes than, than previous generations, but I, I wouldn't define them as a generation that's only gonna rent, only live in apartments yeah. downtown. I think the first indicator that to be trouble in that market would start to see rents starting to, to at least slow down in their increase. And in the metro areas, we haven't seen. You haven't seen softness. You haven't seen it. No, at all. there's no softness there. You know, we're we're, we're uh, we kind of skim past the trade issue. And as you articulated earlier, Doug, that the trade in South Carolina or exports in South Carolina for the first time had seen a decline, not a slowdown, but an actual decline. Actual decline. Right? Um, has there been anecdotal or statistical evidence that says that because of, I'll call it a tiff between the Pacific Rim and North America, um, that there is a, there's real evidence that th that trade is slowed down and we'll expect to see that in North Carolina? I, I, th I think tiff is probably, between Asia and in the U.S., it's, it's more worldwide than that. I mean, we have problems with a lot of, uh, we have issues with a lot of trading partners. Um, Europeans. Europeans particularly. I mean, the- Even post-Brexit now, post-decision oh, yeah, on- Oh, yeah, I mean, no, nothing has changed in terms of the sets of tariffs that are imposed by European countries on U.S. goods and vice versa, other than the steel and aluminum tariffs that were instituted and then the retaliatory tariffs. But the, the big thing, like on autos, there's still a big discrepancy between what we charge on tariffs for European autos coming into this country and what the Europeans charge for autos going into Europe from America. Right. So there's still that big difference. Uh, but I, I think that people don't like uncertainty, whether it's businesses or individuals. They worry about confrontational negotiations, which is apparently the way Trump likes to do things. Um, and as a result of that, they get real nervous and they get real s squirrely about what's going on right now. But if we look at what took place between, what was it again, the US USMCA, uh, I think that the day before that was signed, I think that the, the, the betting would have been 95-5 that we ever would have got Canada. Against? Uh, yeah, we ever got, we would have ever gotten Canada on board, and yet they are on board. Yeah, but it, yeah. I mean, John, isn't that, isn't that kind of an attribute? of the executive branch right now that just when we think we figured that out, it zigs or zags the other way? Well, I'm, I, I'm just saying about the trade. I mean, I, 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 don't think well, you can, good I don't think you can get people, other countries, to give in unless you raise the price okay. from the status quo. And I, and I think there's a recognition of that. And again, nobody, no, I don't think there's a person on this panel that wants a trade war. And I don't think there's a person on this panel that would suggest that a trade war would not be devastating to the U.S. economy. Any other uh, dissenting opinions on that? Well, or another, another angle on how trade has affected North Carolina or the region? Uh, Matt, do it, you see uh, it? As I see it the same way. Uh, trade's one of those things where uh, economists are fairly universal on our approach to it. I'm not sure we're as convincing to the general public as uh, I think we should be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a lot of people really have looked at what we've done with Mexico here that could affect the Carolinas. In and, what way? Well. Uh, the requirement in autos, at least for a certain percentage of the content, that the wages have to be $16 an hour. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that shifts <laughs> competitive advantage back to the Carolinas. We've competed with Mexico now for many years where they're paying in a, a, a tire plant a uh, dollar an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to change. And Mexico wants it too. So in a sense, it was a win-win. But I think it's it's good for the Carolinas because uh, you know, of our manufacturing base. Yeah. So you think this, and we'll call it not by the acronym, but the the, the U.S.-Canada-Mexico agreement, do you think that could spell, a, as, as Doug just said, that could spell a tipping point for the economy or at least a major influencer of the economy? It, it's another point of certainty to, to John's point. You remove that one big uncertainty at least, and so firms can plan around it. Right. That, mm -hmm. I think that's really I think important. we've seen an improvement in re just 
overall relationship between the U.S. and Mexico now that that agreement is, is in place. And it's, it's not in place yet. We're still waiting. It has to be approved. And I think when Congress looks at it, it's the Republicans are going to wonder, are we putting in minimum wages now? Are we yeah. interfering with uh, You don't think that's been trans not transparent, but you don't think they know that by now? I, I assume they know it. We'll see how they vote. <laughs> yeah. I would think this is something the Democrats are going to like. How do you model out the USMCA? <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough to put that in, in your models. I mean, it's tough to put this whole trade dynamic in, in your model because we just we really haven't seen anything like this in, in the modern economy. We don't have a lot of guidance on um, the extent of these tariffs, how long they're going to stick around. Are they going to get to 25% on, okay. on January 1st? Are we going to see tariffs on, yeah. on the other half? It's, it's very tough to, yeah. to actually put them in a, a formal model. Sarah, you had the first question. You get the last comment, so thank you. Uh, Matt, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. John, Doug, good to have you both here. Good to be here. Uh, please stay with us for next week, and I hope you will join us too. Next week is part two, and that is a look ahead, 2019, and by the way, beyond. I uh, hope you'll join us then. Until then, Happy New Year. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by the Duke Endowment, Barings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.